and just welcome everybody to our last meeting or um, webinar, forgot the word, all of a sudden it's, it's the end of a long year as well as a, a middle of a week. So just the last session of the year and we're very, I'm very pleased to invite Ryan again to talk to us because you've done a few for us and we're very, very grateful for this um, on RM or REM, depending on how people say this. And um, I'll pass it over to you because I'm losing all my words. <laughs> so. Awesome. Well, I appreciate the introduction. It's great to be back. So let's go ahead and share my screen. And we're just going to jump right into things. So as Zoe mentioned, today's session is going to be focusing on one of my favorite packages uh, in R. That's the RM package. And we're going to talk about it in the context of our studio projects because they kind of go hand in hand. So if this is the first time you're joining one of these webinars, welcome. My name is Ryan Johnson. I'm a data science advisor here at Posit. Uh, as we mentioned before, for any questions, feel free to pop those into the Zoom chat. I'm going to make sure I have the chat open on my screen so I can see those questions coming in. Um, but I'm also totally okay with if there's a pressing question and you want to come off mute and ask your questions that way, totally fine with being interrupted. So feel free to ask those questions uh, however you like. Because um, I do like to keep these sessions pretty fun, very casual, a nice, safe learning environment. And then we are recording today's ses session, as we mentioned before, and I'll also forward over the slides to your team, just so you have those as a reference. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to start off with an introduction to the RM package. And as we go through today's session, we'll kind of talk about what life is like without RM and how RM can help out. Now, there's for those that may be familiar with the RM package in R, um, know that it can be a bit of a beast. There's a lot of great functions inside of RN, but sometimes there can be a pretty steep learning curve. So if there's three functions I want you all to take away from today's session, it's going to be these three, init, snapshot, and restore. So just remember those three, and I will consider my job a success. But as we go through today's session, I'll certainly highlight some other RM functions. And here's just some additional resources and presentations that I use uh, to create today's content. They're slightly older at this point, but they're very applicable still, including a talk from 2020 by Kevin Uche, who's actually the developer of the RM package and does a really great job just kind of explaining you know, why he created RM and what's its purpose. And then here's my last disclaimer before we jump into the content. So as I mentioned before, RM is a very large package. Um, I find it is, you know, very intuitive to use, but it's certainly, if it's your first time using it, it can be a bit daunting. Um, and so my goal is to hopefully answer as many RM questions as you can, but just know that there's a lot of functions in there and I may not have all the answers for you. Um, but if you do have a question, I don't have the answer uh, top of mind, I'll be sure to follow up with Kevin and some of our other solutions engineers, and we'll try to get you those answers for you. All right, so let's set the stage here of RM, and we're first going to talk about a typical data science project. So let's say you come in Monday morning to the office and you have an email in your inbox saying, here's a new data set and I want you to analyze it. So here's your data. This line is corresponding to time. And to start off the data analysis uh, for your project, you decide you're gonna create an interactive web app using one of the uh, great packages uh, we developed here at Posit called Shiny. So you install Shiny. Some more time goes by and you decide, okay, well now I wanna create a more static document, a report, so I use the R Markdown package. So you install that package. Next, you decide that you wanna do some transformation and massaging of the data set. So you install the dply R package. And so I have three packages in your environment. And then finally you decide, okay, I think I wanna create an API for some analyses that I'm running and I actually don't need Shiny anymore. So you actually remove the Shiny package from your environment. Now the take home message here for this example is that your package environment for a project, it changes over time. You install new packages, you update packages and you might potentially remove packages from your project. And it's gonna be really important that you keep track of this, especially for reproducibility. Things you need to keep track of besides just what packages you're using include what version of those packages and also where you obtain those packages from. So your package repository. So here's gonna be a fun little experiment we're gonna do here. Um, and within Zoom, there should be a way for you to kind of uh, raise your virtual hand, so to speak. And I want you to raise your hand um, by clicking the little Zoom kind of emoji feature, if any of the following scenarios has ever applied to you. Have you ever tried to revisit an old R script and it didn't work? 
Maybe you said something like, I swear this function worked before, but now it's not working. This is probably the most common one. So um, I've already seen a bunch of hands starting to pop up. Yep. All right, we're almost about half of the entire audience has experienced this before. So it's a, I don't know if that's exciting or concerning, but hopefully RM can help. <laughs> All right, here's another example. Um, so go ahead and raise your hand again. If you've ever tried to share our code with a colleague, maybe your future self, and they can't get it to run. Now, why does this run on my computer, but not on Sue's computer? Or John pulled in my project from GitHub, but just can't get it to work. All right, so I'm seeing a lot more hands here as well. Then I have one more scenario, which isn't as common, but may apply to some folks here on the line. Have you ever needed to document your package environment, but you just didn't know how? So maybe you're submitting something and they want you to list every R package and every version of that package you use, but you're just like, I don't know how to do that. Um, so if that's ever applied to you or some variant of that, uh, feel free to raise your hand as well. But regardless, if you've raised your virtual hand for any of these scenarios, then we really need to take a step back and talk about managing your environment, um, specifically package management. Now, I believe in the past, we did a whole session on package management. We took a deep dive into this um, topic, but I just wanna do a very quick high level overview of the three main players when it comes to package management. Obviously your R packages, you're gonna have your libraries, and then importantly, the repositories where you go shopping for packages. So let me just throw some formal definitions at you just so you have them, kind of a boring slide, but let's just get through this one. So an R package, many of you I'm sure have used packages uh, for your R programming before. It's just a standardized collection of material that extends kind of that base R, all right? And within a package, you might find some code, data, documentation, all kind of wrapped up into a pretty package. The take home message for a package is that this is what you interact with. When you're writing R code, you are typically using functions within packages. Next, we have your R library. And this is going to be a place and it's literally gonna be a directory, a file on your computer or your server where R knows to find packages it can use. In other words, this is where you store your packages once you install them on your system. And then finally, we have your R repository. And this is the primary vehicle for organizing and distributing R packages, which is just a fancy way of saying, this is where you install packages from. So when you type out that function, install.packages, you're reaching out to somewhere to install that package from, that's your repository. So going back to our project, um, there's a few questions you need to be able to answer for every single package that's in your project. The first one being, where did I obtain that package from? So what are my repositories? Where is that package stored? What is my package library? And then finally, what's really important for today's session is what package version am I using? So again, can you answer these questions over the entire lifespan of your data science project? If not, that's totally okay. And that's the whole purpose of today's session and a kind of a good introduction to the RM package. And as a quick side note, I can at least confirm from the developer himself that it is pronounced RENV. And the reason why is because it's actually just a shorthand for reproducible environments. So R and then the N for environments. So RM is always used in combination with another tool that we're gonna talk about today called RStudio Projects. And so when you have a project that uses RM, it provides some advantages including making your project much more isolated. So RN actually gives your projects access to its own private package library. So in this little diagram over here on the right-hand side, we have an RStudio project using RN and inside of the project, so inside this box includes all the R packages represented by these little hex icons that are inside the, the project itself. All right, and that's something that's not typically native to like your R analyses. It's something that RM helps out with. By doing this, it kind of encapsulates your entire project and makes it much more portable. So you can easily move a project from one computer to the next, one operating system to another. And finally, which is really important for today's session, it helps with reproducibility. Um, so RM captures a lot of great information so that someone else can actually rerun your project. Now, if this is your first time even hearing about RM, the best way, at least in my opinion, to think about it is like a camera. 
So imagine you're writing some R code and you just take your hands off the keyboard, you grab a camera and you take a picture of your computer. At that exact moment, it's gonna spit out a photograph and it's gonna capture some stuff about your project, including what packages you're using, what versions of those packages and where you obtain those packages from, your repository. So going back to our project timeline that we talked about earlier. So we have all these packages that we've been installing, potentially updating, even maybe removing. How do we keep track of it using our env? Well, that's again, the role of that camera analogy. So every time you make some changes to your packages, you wanna grab your camera and take another picture. You wanna take a snapshot, it's actually called. Obviously our env is not a camera, it's a package in R. So we're not actually taking a, uh, a photograph, but instead we're actually capturing all this information into what's known as an R env lock file. Here's an example R env lock file. It's not the prettiest thing to look at because it's written in this JSON format, so it's very machine readable. But from the human perspective, it's not too hard to understand. So let's just go and run through it from top to bottom. At the very top of every single R env lock file is gonna include some information about which R version you use for this project. So here in this lock file, we're using R 4.1 for this project. Next, we have your active R repositories. So in this project, when you go to install a package, where did you install that package from? All the information about your active repositories is included right here in this blue text. And here you can see we're actually just using CRAN and here's the URL for the actual repository. Everything else in the lock file is going to be your R package records needed for this specific project. And in this example lock file, we just have two packages. We have the markdown package and we have the mime package. And within each package is kind of these like sub metadata. Um, so we're just going go through, you know, what type of information is included for every single package. So obviously we have the package name and then real important here, it may seem pretty simple, but this is something that RM is really good at is that it captures which version of this package you're using. Uh, for those that may not be familiar with like R or Python or open source data science, you know, packages are like the bread and butter and packages can be developed by anyone and used by anyone. And oftentimes these packages will be rapidly updating. So you may have version 1.0, but in two months from now, it may be 2.0 or maybe 1.5. So it's always a good idea to keep track of these versions. And that's what RM is here to help out with. Next, we had the source and repository, which is just information about where you obtain this package from. So for this markdown package, I obtained it from the CRAN repository. And then this last one here, this hash, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later on when we talk about package caching. So let's just kind of put that in the back burner for right now. All right, so as we go through today's session, we're gonna kind of walk through a few different workflows. And this is gonna be the first one. Again, I want you to think of it like you come in Monday morning um, and you get this brand new project thrown at you. And at that exact moment, you decide, okay, I'm gonna start a new project. I'm going to initialize it with our end right out of the gate. So that's what we're gonna do here first. I'm gonna show you how to create a project and initialize it with our end. And then once we have done that, you know, you go about your normal data science business. You install packages, you write some code, you install other packages. And then you wanna take a snapshot of your project every time your package environment changes. And then we can always use that lock file to restore your environment if needed. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that uh, later on. So for right now, I'm gonna switch over to my development environment. So the RStudio IDE, and I'm gonna be using Posit Workbench for this, but all these workflows would apply to wherever you're using the RStudio IDE. And I'm gonna show you how to initialize it with our end right out of the gate. So here's Posit Workbench. So if you're not familiar with Posit Workbench, this is the landing page when you first log in. Over here on the right-hand side, you can see some projects that I've been working on, but I can also start a brand new session over here on the left-hand side. So I can click new session. Within Posit Workbench, we currently support four different IDEs, uh, including VS Code, Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook. But for today's session, we're gonna be sticking with RStudio. So let me go ahead and start a brand new session. All right, so once we open up that session, we'll see the RStudio IDE. 
And again, the, the benefit of using Posit Workbench here is that I'm running it within my web browser. So you could really continue your development wherever you have internet access and you just log into the remote server that's running Posit Workbench. So for those that are not familiar with the RStudio IDE, just to give you a lay of the land here, on the left-hand side, this is your console. So this big window, and this is a live window into the R programming language. So you can write some R code like two plus two. In the top right corner, you'll see your environment pane. And then the bottom right, we'll see our file directory. Now within this RStudio IDE, this session right now, I'm not currently using a project. How do I know that? So if you look in the top right corner, this is just how I find to be the best way to let you know if you're using a project you'll see project none. And that's a great indicator letting you know you're not currently using a project. So we're gonna fix that. We're gonna go ahead and start a brand new project. Before I do that, the last thing I wanna mention here before we create this project, I'm clicking on the packages tab here. And everything you see, these like little uh, hyperlinks, these are packages currently in my environment. And I have two different libraries. I have a user library, which are packages I've installed. And I also have my system library. These are packages installed with my system administrator. But importantly, we're missing a library that RM provides. That's your project library. And so we're gonna get access to that here in a second once we initialize this project. So to initialize this project with our env, we're gonna do it in two different ways here. I'm gonna click on the project none at the very top and you're gonna see new project. This is actually one way to do it. You can alternatively click this icon over here on the left-hand side underneath the edit button. That would do the same thing. Or you can go to file, new project. That also does the same thing. So once we click that button, you're gonna get a choice. How do you wanna create this project? Is it going to be in a brand new directory that you create on your file system? Is it going to be in an existing directory that's already been created and you just want to initialize that project? Or do you want to pull in a project from version control? And this is actually something we're going to show you a little bit later. But for right now, let's just go ahead and click new directory. The very top option, new project, that's what we want to select. And let's go ahead and give this project a name. I'm going to say test proj rn. I'm going to place this directory in my home directory, which is represented by the tilde. And then real importantly here, you're going to see two boxes underneath this text box create a Git repository and use RN with this project. Now for reproducibility, we would certainly recommend using version control, but just for today's session, I'm gonna leave this one unchecked because uh, version control is a whole nother session that we can dive into. But if we want to initialize this project with RN right out of the gate, make sure you click that box right there. And once you've done that, that's all you need to do, click create project and we're going to open up a new RStudio session. So every time you open up a new project, it'll open over uh, a new RStudio session. And here we are now within that project. How do I know? If you look in the top right corner, we now see the name of the project we just created. There's a few other ways you know you can, you're within a project. So if you see this rproj file, this is always placed in the home directory of your new project, which you, this is kind of a fun fact with the RStudio IDE, you can always go back to your project's home directory by clicking this little R icon over here on the left right hand side. So for example, if you navigate pretty deep into your file structure here, you can always go back home by clicking that little R icon. And then you'll also see a few other things in this project that were created by our env, including the rmlock lock file. And there's also this rmdirectory. directory. And this directory, we're gonna talk a little bit more about later, but this is where actually all of your, pa your packages for your project live. So again, it's within the project itself. And I'm also want to show you the packages tab now. So we still have my user library. We still have, well, there's a system library here as well. Um, but most importantly, I now have access to a project library, right? This library right here is only made available if you're using our env. And if I click on the lock file, let's take a look at it here. And it's pretty simple. We're using R version 4.3.2, which you can also see reflected up here in the top right corner. As a fun fact, with that Posit Workbench, you can actually have multiple versions of R installed, which is a cool feature. Here you can see I'm using CRAN um, as my, uh, my main repository, but it's being served from Package Manager, which is one of our other professional tools that we offer. Now, the only package 
that my project currently depends on right now is the RM package. That's it. I haven't done any type of data science so far. I only have the RF package and you can see some information like the name, the current version uh, and where I obtained it from. There's a few other things down here that we're not gonna talk about today. Uh, it's a little slightly more advanced topic. And then you can see that hash down here, which is important for global package caching, which we will talk about later on. So that's one workflow. And I wanna quickly show you an additional workflow because this was always a common question I would get after the session is, okay, Ryan, well, I already have all these RStudio projects created. Can I actually go back into them and initialize them with RM? And the answer is yes. So if any of you on the call have RStudio projects on your computer or on your server already, you can initialize them with RM later on. You don't have to do it right at the start. And then once we do that, the set setup will be exactly the same. We'll set the stage so you can go about your data science business, snapshot your environment as packages change, and then use that lock file to uh, restore your environment if needed. So let me just quickly show you this workflow. I'm gonna open an RStudio project, and then I'm going to subsequently initialize it with RN by using a function called init, which is just shorthand for initialize. So I'm gonna come back here to posit workbench, and I'm gonna go back to the home page, which is represented by this little home icon at the very top of your screen. And I'm gonna open up another RStudio session, which is another advantage of Posit Workbench is you can have multiple RStudio and other IDEs going at the exact same time. So here in this session, again, I'm not currently within a project. So let's go ahead and change that. I'll select this box, click new project. This is the same workflow we just went through. So I'm gonna go through new directory, new project. And I'm gonna say test, Proj no RN, because I'm actually gonna leave this box unchecked for right now. And let's go ahead and create project. So here's that RStudio session. This is now within an RStudio project, because you can see I have the name of the project up here. But the first thing you'll notice is that my project, my file directory, it's a little more scammed. There's only, the only thing inside of it right now is that rproj file. So I'm not seeing anything RN related. And if I click on the packages tab, you can see I still don't have access to that project library. So if you have a, a project here that's not currently using RN and you want to initialize it with RN, all you need to do is go to your console and from the RM package, run the init function. And that's it. Hit enter and RN will take care of the rest for you. All righty, let me actually just refresh here. Okay, perfect, there we go. And I actually automatically restarted my R session for me. So you can see restarting R session down here. And now my file directory looks a bit more like the other session did. You can see I have my RM lock file. Here's that RM directory. Click on the packages tab and I now have access to that project library. All right, so what do we have now? Well, we have access to this private project library. That's really kind of like the take home message. So we have this project here, this RStudio project. And within that project, we have a home directory. So all of our analyses will be within the single directory. So it makes everything nice and encapsulated. Inside that directory will be your code, your data, your results, tables, figures. And then most importantly, you'll have a private project library specific to this project and only this project. That, I can't emphasize that enough. That's how RM is like benefiting you here. So you can have all these packages associated with a single project and it won't impact any other projects on your system. So now that we've set the stage, it's time to go data science crazy. And you can do whatever you want. You can create a shiny app, create our markdown, do whatever type of R analyses you're, you want. And as you install packages or update packages or remove packages, you want to use the RM package to basically update that lock file. And we do that by using another function called snapshot. Again, that will be akin to taking that camera and taking a picture of your computer and recording what packages you're using, what versions, and where you obtain those packages from. So let's go ahead. I'm gonna create a Shiny application in the environment we just created. And then I'll show you how we can use a snapshot function to update our lock file. So I'm gonna come back over here to the same RStudio project that we're working with. So I'll come back to my home directory here and I'll go ahead and clear my console. So let's go ahead and create a piece of content. 
Because right now, as you can see with a lock file, the only thing in my lock file is the arm package. That's it. So I'm going to create a Shiny application. In the top left corner here, we have a drop-down menu, which includes a bunch of starter scripts, including the ability to create a Shiny web app. So we might need to install the Shiny package quick, which will go pretty darn fast. So I'll say yes. So as we install all these packages and its various dependencies, um, I am using Package Manager for this. And the benefit is that I can install pre-compiled Linux binaries. So this is this going through all the installation of uh, Shiny and its dependency packages. So let's take a few seconds here. All right, it's all done. Let's give our application a name. I'll say, mm, we'll say test app one, two, three, four, being creative. We'll make it just a single Shiny application, single file, so app.r, and I'm going to place it in our project, this test proj no rm, uh, which is the project we're currently within. And I'll hit create. Now, if you've never seen a Shiny application before, I should note that you can develop a Shiny application in R, which has been around for well over a decade at this point. But we also recently announced a, a framework for creating Shiny applications in Python as well. Just want to make sure you're all aware of that. But this is a Shiny application. It's pretty simple. It's only about 50 lines of code, and it's nothing but R code. So that's the important point, is that you don't need to know anything about the typical languages for web applications, like HTML or CSS or JavaScript. You only need to know R code. And I can run this application right here within the RStudio IDE by clicking Run App. And once I do that, we'll get this example Shiny application, which I'm sure many of you have seen before. It's just showing a histogram but the ability for you to interact with it. So I can click on the slider bar and I can drag it to the left, drag it to the right, and you can see how the number of bins in the histogram changes. So this is the beauty of Shiny, the ability for you to interact with your data, create dashboards, interactive dashboards. Uh, really the sky's the limit in terms of what you can do with Shiny. So now we have a Shiny application in our project. Right? And you can see right here on line 10, I'm loading the Shiny package. So my project now has a dependency on the Shiny package. So we're going to go ahead and update our lock file. So let me come back to my lock file right here. And you can see it's still just RM. That's it. It's the only package currently recorded. So we should probably update it because we've now installed Shiny. So within the console down here, I'm going to run RN snapshot and just hit enter. One of the best parts about RN, why I like it so much, is because it's it will always try its best to inform you what will happen if you decide to proceed and give you the option to either continue or actually to say, pump the brakes a bit and say, okay, let's wait a second, and you can drop out of the, the command. So by running snapshot, it's letting me know that the following packages will be updated in the log file. And you can see all these packages listed over here on the left-hand side. And then you'll see this syntax right here. This asterisk represents a package that's not currently in my lock file and will be written to my lock file with the associated version. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, Ryan, I thought you just installed Shiny. Why are we seeing all these other packages here? So Shiny is right down here towards the bottom. It is very common in R and also Python that packages depend on other packages. So by installing the Shiny package, it actually requires a bunch of other packages be present as well. So these are all officially dependencies on Shiny and my project as a whole. So since we want to capture all those dependencies and include them in our lock file, it's going to ask us down here at the bottom, do we want to proceed? And we can just say Y for yes, hit enter, and it will spit out some output saying lock file written to the lock file right here in our project directory. Let me actually show you the current state of the lock file now. So you can see there's already a lot more package information included here. And if I just stop and look at JSON Lite, the associated versions, where I obtained it from. So the important thing to here to note is that you don't ever have to manually uh, change the lock file. Our end will do all of that for you. All right, so that's how you can update that lock file as you install, update, or remove packages from, from your project. So a few other things to know about. Before calling snapshot and really just running this command uh, frequently, it's never a bad idea. Uh, it's probably the function I run the most called status. And what status will do is it'll show differences between your project's lock file, so the current state of your lock file, and the current state of your project library. 
So if it's been a while since you've run Snapshot and maybe you've installed a bunch of packages or made a bunch of changes to your packages, you may just want to run uh, status just to get a sense of, okay, well, what's different between my current project and what's encoded in my lock file? And if you ever want to know how these snapshots work, I should mention that snapshotting, you can actually do it in a variety of ways, but by default, it will use something known as implicit snapshotting. I would say for 99% of your workflows, you're probably gonna wanna use implicit snapshotting. So you won't really have to manually change this, the behavior at all. So how does implicit snapshotting work? Well, when you call snapshot, like we just did in that demo, it's going to kind of peruse your project source code. All right, so it's going to look, maybe you have a Shiny application, maybe you have a Plumber API, maybe you have an R Markdown document. It's going to run through your code and look for any bits of code where you implicitly call a package. So the library function, for example, is an implicit call for a package. It captures all those dependencies and will record them in the lock file. And if you're ever curious to know what your implicit dependencies are, there's another function to know about in RM called dependencies. And this won't write anything to your lock file. It'll just print some helpful information to your console, showing you all the source code in your project and what are the implicit dependencies. And just note that it kind of uh, lists it at the very high level. So you can see here with this uh, Shiny application, we know there's a bunch of sub-dependencies for Shiny, but it's just gonna show Shiny at the kind of at that top level. So you have this lock file. And it's so important for reproducibility because it's kind of like the blueprint for your project's package library. But it is also something that you need to maintain. And that can be a bit daunting. So how do you kind of keep track of the evolution of your lock file? Well, you keep track of it the same way you track any other piece of source code in your project. And you do that with version control. So seeing here, we have four different states of an example library where we have a bunch of packages here that are all version one. Maybe you update some packages here, you update some other packages, maybe you install a development version of a package uh, and so on. And so as your package environment changes, you wanna grab your RM camera and take a snapshot and record the package environment, the current state. And then as you make changes, it's always a good idea to commit those changes to version control. So whether you're using GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, and just commit those to version control. Something our end will actually do in the background, which is pretty cool, is that anytime you make a commit with the lock file included, it will record that commit. And you can actually see all of your prior commits in which the lock file has changed using the history function. And that will print out to the console a bunch of hashes associated with that commit. And if you need to revert your lock file back to a previous state, so let's say you're over here on the right-hand side and you've worked something, right? There's something wrong with your project. And you're like, okay, let's revert my lock file back to you know over here with commit number one. You can do that. And then you can use that lock file to restore your environment if needed. I, I put this slide in here because this was a question I was getting common um, you know, during these sessions was, you know, we really only talked about CRAN and a little bit about package manager, but what if I'm pulling in packages from a bunch of different sources? And that's okay. You can absolutely do that. And RM is actually pretty good at keeping track of where you obtain all these packages from. So if you're pulling in packages from CRAN, uh, Posit Package Manager, Bioconductor, um, or even from Git, um, you can certainly do that. And that information will be recorded in your log file. And also, if you're pulling in projects uh, or packages from private repositories, uh, there are some workflows in which RM can capture that information as well. OK, so I want to switch gears a little bit. And we're going to talk about two different workflows that are really important. And that's going to be restoring your project library. And then we're going to wrap up talking about kind of pulling in a project from version control. And they kind of go hand in hand. So restoring your project library. We have this lock file. And another way to think of a lock file, so I've been kind of talking about it in the context of like a photograph, but you can also think of it like a blueprint for a building, for example. So this blueprint contains all the information needed to rebuild your project's package library if needed. And what you can actually do is feed this blueprint to our env, that's your construction workers here, and it can rebuild your project's library exactly as it's laid out in that lock file. So if in order to do that, um, to kind of rebuild a project as it's encoded in this lock file, uh, we're going to use this restore function. 
And it will read in that lock file, restore the project's package library um, exactly as it's laid out. And once we do that at the version control kind of uh, workflow, um, I'll actually kind of demonstrate this functionality. So before we do that, I do have a kind of a, a few other things to keep in mind when you're using RENV. And one of those is that um, you know, RENV is really good at what it's designed to do, and that's to manage your project's package library. Something it will not do is change which R version you're using. So for example, if you go to use someone else's project and you take a peek at that lock file and you notice that it's using a different R version that you currently have available on your system, just note that reproducibility, it may not be perfect because you, you're simply using two different versions of R. So to truly reproduce a project, you want to take a take a quick peek at that lock file and see if there's any way that you can uh, match the R version before restoring that project. And again, something that package manager or um, Posit Workbench is really good at is having multiple versions of R available to your developers. So you can always uh, have those versions installed on your server and easily switch over to a different R version to match that lock file. So let's just do a quick review here. And um, just talk about everything we've talked about to this point. First being, how do you initialize a project with RN? And we talked about two different ways. You can use the user interface of the RStudio IDE by clicking this little box right here when you create a new project. Or you can go into a previous project and just run the init function. Once you've done that, the stage is set and you can go about your data science business. And as you install new packages, update them, remove them, you want to take a snapshot to update your lock file. And then down here at the bottom, something we're going to demonstrate here in a second, is you want to be able to restore your R package environment for that project. We, you can do that using the restore function. So just one more thing to talk about before we give that last demo. And this is a little bit of a peek behind the curtain on how R end works, because I think it's pretty darn cool. So let's talk about life before R end existed. All right, and let's think of this as like your computer or your server. And here's your R environment. And you may have multiple projects within your R environment. And if you're not using R env, these projects will all be kind of pointing to a single library of packages. Now, it's a little bit hard to do, but it's certainly possible where a project can make a change to your library, which could certainly impact the other projects on your system. And that is never a good state to be in. So you never want to have a, be able to have a project impact another project on your system. But with the help of RM, because we've encapsulated all of the packages within each project, um, in this situation, you'll never have an instance where this project could impact another project on your system. So that's kind of the beauty of RM. Now, some of you may be thinking, okay, well, here's four projects, but what if my system has like a thousand projects on it? And every single project is using the Shiny package, for example. That's now a thousand different times you've installed the Shiny package on your system. And it may seem like a huge waste of space. So how our env actually works behind the scenes is that it's not actually physically installing packages into your uh, various projects. And instead, it's pointing to something known as a global package cache. And the, the actual kind of packages installed in your project are nothing but symbolic links to this global package cache. So if you're using a, a Mac or a Linux machine, those are sim links, or if you're using a Windows machine that are known as junction points to this global package cache. And if you're ever curious to know, like where does this global package cache live on my system? So depending on your operating system, you can navigate to these various paths, but you can also change where your global package cache lives right, by defining this RM path cache environment variable. So going back to our lock file and just focusing here on the markdown package, I mentioned before that there's this hash at the very bottom. So this hash is what's used by RM to take a look into that global package cache and find that specific package and that specific version as defined um, in your uh, project. And just know that RM is extremely customizable. If you don't want to use a global package cache, you don't have to. And you can change some of the settings. So use cache set to false, in which case all of the packages will, in fact, be physically installed into each individual project. 
All right, so in our last workflow, and what I think is probably the most important workflow is collaborating with our end. And when I say collaborating, that can certainly be collaborating with a colleague, um, but oftentimes it's gonna be collaborating with your future self. So how do we do this? Well, if you want to collaborate with our end, there's a few kind of checks that we need to uh, make sure we complete. The first one here, this is pretty obvious, but we have to make sure this is done, is you need some way to share your source code. So you need to be using version control. So using GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, uh, you need a way to share your source code. Um, you need to explicitly initialize your projects with our end. So you can either do that from the get-go by checking that box we discussed before or running the init function. And then you want to share your project source code, so your Shiny apps, your R Markdown documents, alongside your RM block file to version control. And then a collaborator, or again, your future self, they can actually pull in your project, and all they need to do to, do to restore the project's package library is run the restore function. And that's what we're going to do here right now. So I'm going to pull in a project from GitHub that I actually created over two years ago. And I made a few changes about five or so months ago, just to kind of uh, update some of the R versions. But otherwise, this is a pretty old project. And before we pull in this project to our studio, I mentioned before that you always want to keep track of the lock file. So if we see right down here, I have my lock file included in this GitHub repository. I'm going to click on it. And the first thing I'm going to note right here is which R version that I use for this project. Again, this is something that our end will not do automatically. So it's not going to automatically run 4.2.3 for you. Uh, you need to kind of do your best to match this version. So I'm just going to take a, a quick note that this is the version of R being used for this project. So for the first thing we're going to do is pull in this GitHub repository as a project in our studio. So I'm going to grab the URL for this project. Um, and before we do that, actually, just to kind of run through like, what is this project? Well, it's pretty silly. There's not any, it's not really doing anything. I just included like an example Plumber API, an example Shiny application. I even had this R script that the only thing it does is install packages. That's it. All right. So it's kind of a silly project, but I wanted to kind of replicate, you know, some actual, you know, pieces of content and then being able to install packages from various sources. So let's come back to Posit Workbench. I'm going to click on my home screen, and we're going to open up a third RStudio session. And the first thing I'm going to do in this new RStudio session that's not currently within our project, I'm going to go through that same workflow. So new project. But this time, instead of new directory, I'm actually going to pull in a project from version control. So I'll select this bottom option. We're using Git. Uh, we also support subversion. I've yet to meet a team that uses SVN, but we do. Um, so I Git, and I'm going to paste in the URL for this GitHub repository. Um, I'll leave the name right here as our project, and I'll just put um, GH for GitHub, and we'll put this project right here in my home directory. And then again, a benefit of um, Posit Workbench is I can define which R version I want to use for this project. 4.3.2 is a slightly uh, newer version that's encoded in a lock file. So I'm actually going to go back to 4.2.3 to match the R version in the lock file. And we'll hit Create Project. All right, so it'll take a few more seconds. It's got to pull in all that source code, which should go pretty quick here. Alrighty, so let's just do a quick uh, kind of lay of the land here. You can see over here in the console, um, we already have some information being printed out here by our env. And it's kind of in this red scary text, but I don't want it to scare you because this is just our env's best attempt to try to help inform you of what's going on. We can see I'm currently within that project in the top right corner. And here's all those files that we just pulled in from the GitHub repository, including the lock file. All right, so again, that's pretty important. We wanna make sure we include that lock file. And if we take a look at some of this text right here, it's saying, you know, we've, um, it, the project might be out of sync, all right? So what's encoded in my lock file may not be exactly what's in my project environment. And we can actually see that. So if I go to my packages tab right here, something that some of you may have noticed before, is that when you use our env and you have this lock file, it actually includes another column in this packages tab. 
And here you can see all the various packages that are being defined in the lock file with their associated versions. And over here in the column right to the left is what's currently in my environment. And so you can see I'm missing a lot of packages. And in some cases I may have uh, the wrong version of a package. So the, the ideal goal here is you want this version column to match what's in your lock file column. And in order to do that, the only thing we're gonna run here, so I'm gonna clear my screen, is I'm gonna run rn restore. That's it. I'm gonna hit enter. And just like snapshotting, nothing's gonna happen immediately. This is going to print to the console some information about what will happen if I decide to proceed. So it's letting me know that the following packages will be updated. So I have a few packages I'm pulling in from Bioconductor and also some from RStudio or Posit Package Manager. And so if this all looks good to you and you want to use that lock file to restore your project environment, do you wanna proceed? I'll say Y for yes, hit enter. And this should go pretty quick. There we go, it's already done. So now if you look at our packages tab right here, you'll notice that everything in my active projects library, right, all these packages completely matches what's in my lock file. So we are now in a perfect state in order to continue the analyses as they were in that project that was on GitHub. And the last thing I wanna mention here is just how fast that went. And if you look at the console here, it's saying like installing profits and the associated version, and then you see linked cache, that's because these packages were already in my global package cache. So the more packages that get added to that cache, the faster it will be to restore your project. Um, and if that package is not currently in your cache, it'll reach out to that same repository that's listed in your lock file, or at least do its best attempt to, um, and pull in that project, and then it will cache it uh, for later use. All right, so just to recap here, and then we can open it up to any questions. So again, if there's three functions I want you all to remember from today, it's init, snapshot, and restore. Those are the big three that I think will get you through 90, probably 95% of all of your workflows using our end. But there's a few others to keep in mind, uh, like status, dependency, uh, history, and revert, uh, especially status, because again, that's probably the one I use the most. And then my last kind of slide here, is that RM, it's really one piece of the reproducibility puzzle. And it's really good at what it's designed to do. And that is to manage your package, your project's package dependencies. But if you truly want to reproduce an environment, there's gonna be a few additional pieces to this puzzle, including what operating system is being used, what R version is being used, R package compilers can differ from one computer to the next, system libraries also uh, differ like LePack and BLOSS, so these all, all these other puzzle pieces need to be accounted for if you truly want to reproduce an environment 100%. So because of that, there's a lot of interest in using our end in combination with other tools like Docker, for example, where a lot of these other puzzle pieces can be better controlled for. So with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up, um, but hopefully this was a good introduction to RM. There's a lot of really cool workflows you can go through, um, especially on the RM uh, website. So I'll just actually pop this into the chat so you all have it. Um, but we actually recently redid this uh, page, the RM page. So uh, check it out. You know, this is Kevin's best attempt here to um, kind of lay out all the various workflows that are available with RM, kind of how it works. Um, it's a really, uh, really useful uh, documentation. Uh, but with that, I will go ahead and ask any questions. Just as people are thinking or typing, I'll just say thank you. For that. that was really a great tour of RM. It's good to know mm -hmm. how to say it properly as well. <laughs> yeah, it's important. Because <laughs> I didn't know. Um, that happens with our packages quite a lot of the time, doesn't it? So I've been mm -hmm. using it, but I didn't know what I was using. So it's always very useful to go back over your things as well and then find out more. Like, why, yeah. why was I doing that? That's really good. Um, oh, right. Questions come through. Yep. I can take a look at some of these. So one question. I sometimes have difficulties with RM lock files between my local machines and when trying to deploy a Shiny app on our uh, Posit Connect. Uh, but any tips for this? Yeah, so I want to... Um, at least when it comes to connect, that's kind of an important piece here. So for those that um, that are using Posit Connect currently, so let's say you have like a Shiny application in your environment and you wanna publish that to connect. If you're gonna be using the push button deployment, so if you have an application right here and you click this little blue button right here, I would actually recommend that you actually don't even think about RM in this case, all right? So by using push button deployment, 
Um, our studio and Posit Connect, it'll actually do all the dependency capturing for you. You don't have to do any of that manually using RM or anything like that. So I really want you to kind of like decouple the publishing process to connect from your local environment, your local development that's using RM. So all you need to do is click publish and that's all you need to do. You don't need to include your lock file or anything right here in your uh, deployment bundle. Um, for those that are also using a, a workflow called Git Back Deployment, where you might have a piece of content hosted on GitHub and deploying directly from GitHub, um, you may be familiar with something known as a manifest file. All right, it's a manifest.json file. Um, it's very similar to a lock file, but again, that's something that's created by our, our, our studio automatically when you use push button deployment. Um, but you do need to create that file manually if you're using Git Back Deployment. But anytime you're thinking about publishing to connect, don't worry about the RNF lock file in your local environment. Posit Connect will take care of all that um, dependency capturing for you. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps um, kind of tackle that question. Let me just make sure I got everything there. Yep, yeah. Uh, if, you're, if you're deploying to Azure, to AWS, to GCP, it should work just fine, um, just as long as like your development environment, wherever you're doing your coding, can speak to that environment. Um, but yeah, that's something that Connect does, the dependency capturing. It does all that for you. Um, it's just trying its absolute best to kind of take that kind of, you know, you know, capturing those dependencies can be hard, um, especially if you forget something. Um, we just want to take that you know, piece of the equation out so um, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, another question here. I don't use RN when developing a package, but I've collaborated with people who do. Do you have any thoughts on whether that's a good or bad idea? I think it's a great idea. Um, coming back to the RM documentation, there is a whole section on package um, development. Um, so I, I, I have not developed too many packages in my lifetime. Um, but if you are going to be developing a package, it's important to document your environment that you use to develop that package. Um, so there's a few things you might want to consider. So I would just recommend checking out this package de uh, development section on the RM GitHub pages. Um, that should cover hopefully all the questions that you need. I have a question as well, mm -hmm. sort of along those lines. Um, so when your packages are no longer needed, because I was just looking at a, a thing that I have been using, mm -hmm. and I think there's a reference to a package that I might have typed in and then subsequently removed, so they're still in when RM, mm -hmm. sorry, correct myself. Yep. Um, so I can remove that mm -hmm. because it doesn't pick it up through the status. Is that, or am I doing something wrong? Do I have to manually remove? But status will tell you what you're missing and what you need to update. It doesn't tell you, oh, no, you're not using that package anymore, or... Have I, am I actually using it? And I didn't realize that's the yeah. other thing. I don't want to delete it just yet. And I was like, oh, maybe it was yeah. dependency I'd missed. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So, um, and I'll, I'll try to kind of explain it in this environment right here. Actually, let me go back to um, my other session, which might be a little simpler. Um, so in this project right here, I just had that single shiny application. That's the only thing currently in my project, all right? Um, but I have installed Shiny in this environment. So Shiny is in my, my library and it's ready to be used. Now, if I decide to kind of go into this and delete it, all right? So I've now removed the Shiny application from my project. There is now no longer a dependency on Shiny. So even though I haven't deleted the package itself, if I come in here and do RM status, it's likely going to come in here and say, yeah, so all these packages, these are all the dependencies of Shiny, including the Shiny package here. Um, if we look at these columns, so is it installed in my environment? It is. Is it recorded in the lock file? It is currently. Am I currently using it? No, I'm not. And so if that's the case, we can do RM snapshot. And it's going to let me know that all these packages that are currently in my lock file, I'm no longer using. And so it'll update my lock file by removing it from the lock file. And if I can do that, I'll hit Y for yes. And now my lock file is back to that simple state. It just uses our end. That's really helpful because I am mm -hmm. using it then. So it's not showing up, but I must uh, sort of work out why that particular package is is being, how it's being used. So that's really, really helpful in a kind of like metadata way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, like, you don't have to worry about actually like managing the library itself. Like, you don't have to re remove packages yeah. manually from it. 
Um, as long as you're not using it in your source code, RM yeah. can detect that and will automatically uh, match your lock file accordingly. No, yeah, I think what I've got is a dependency on a on a package in GitHub that a colleague is running, and so that mm -hmm. could change. So I need to sort of like be careful of my package dependencies, but I didn't know, so yeah. that's really great. There is another question, I think. Yep, I can. So it doesn't have to do with RM. So let's see if I can no. uh, tackle this one. I found when using our projects, very occasionally there will be some script document leak, either from previous commits or other projects. This is potentially from OneDrive. Yeah, that's. I'm probably not going to have too much insight into that without having a better understanding of kind of your environment. You know what what's actually being leaked, what kind of error messages, or what you're actually seeing. So, um, so I probably can't help too much right now, kind of on the fly, but. Um, I mean, maybe this is something you might want to talk internally with, with a group, maybe someone that's experiencing a similar thing. Um, but you might also want to think about um, posting to our community page. Um, so if you've never seen our community page before, it's kind of like Stack Overflow, um, but it's more specific to posit stuff. Um, and so for our Python stuff, um, you might want to post that question and try to provide as much information about what's being leaked, um, kind of your environment and hopefully the the greater R community can help out uh, rather than just me. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Straying into Microsoft territory there as well, which is quite oh, difficult. Yeah. But so One thank time. you very much. Um, I think we've time at time and um, we'll, we'll wrap up. Thank you so much for the contributions of questions as well, everybody. That was really great. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody had a bit of a technical issue with seeing the slides with Zoom. And I was wondering if the slides are available for catch up as well as the video that we'll be sharing. Yeah, I'll send the um, I'll send the slides over to your team afterwards. So you have those. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. I will stop recording if I can find it.